What we've been talking about faith, we've been going through a <coughs> series on faith, and today we're looking at faith through storms. Beginning of our series, Pastor Carl spoke about the, uh, the miracle of the loaves and the fishes, how one little boy stepped forward in faith and God did an amazing miracle, amazing miracle of provision. Last week, Duncan talked about the lady who had the long-standing uh, medical condition and Jairus with his, uh, his ailing daughter and how they reached out to Jesus and how they got a, an amazing answer to prayer in the midst of their faith. Well, faith is a, obviously, a very important part of Christian life. In fact, the Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So the central, centrality of our faith is obvious. But there's something that's just as sure as that, and that is that our faith will be tested. As much as we have to have faith to follow God, that faith, at some point, is going to be tested. Um, just wanted to hear who, who would recognise in whatever your journey with Christ so far that you've had something, a test of your faith that may not have been uh, earth-shattering, but a time when you've really had to, to, to question what's going on in your life, your faith being tested. Can I see your hands? Quite a number of us. More than half of us here have had uh, at least uh, a strong sense of our faith being tested. And I think that in the area of well, if our faith has been tested, I think one of the strongest uh, expressions of that are often in regard to our own families. You know, our children, our grandchildren, our husband, our wife, our brothers and sisters. The, the test of our faith that comes in, in terms of our family going through something is often one of the strongest tests of all. On uh, Sunday the 27th of September 2009, nearly 10 years ago, Josie and I found ourselves in the States, in California. Um, some would know that we have a um, son who's married to an American girl, and they have uh, four boys, and it's uh, Brittany and, and Rod, and they have their four boys. And when we go and visit with them, uh, we attend their church, Reality Santa Barbara, with Pastor Rick Merrick. And uh, so on that 27th of September, we were there uh, together, and Pastor Britt got up to speak, and even though he didn't know what was going on, I think anyone else said you, clearly he was, uh, he was troubled in his spirit. And he went on to tell us that on the previous Monday, just a few days before, uh, five-year-old Daisy Love, their daughter, there she is there, she had, had a fall at school. And so they went and picked her up, took to the doctor, as you do, and in the course of the examination to see whether she had any broken bones or anything, they found that she had a cancerous tumour in her abdomen the size of a grapefruit, which had been hidden, obviously, in the, in the tummy area, but that was discovered. And he told us that in the natural, the outlook was not good for that tumour. It's called a Wilms, Wilms tumour, and it was not good. But Brim went on to talk, and he said that, that he and his wife, Kate, and, and sat in the hospital with uh, little Daisy Love, and um, they obviously a lot of crying and uh, to one another and out to God, of course. And he said this: he said uh, he spoke to God and said, "God, I ask you to heal my daughter. We love her and don't want to lose her. Please heal her. But I tell you this, God: if she is not healed, if we lose her from us." then I promise you this. I know he's going to promise. But he said, it will not change anything between you and me. Isn't that amazing? What a huge test of faith and what a response. Now as I was preparing this message, I couldn't help but think about Pastor Carl and Jess and little Summer. I thought, even little Blondie like that as well. I couldn't help thinking, did you know? This is a real experience. This is a real faith experience in the family's life. There's a pastor, my pastor Carl, and yet went through this, this experience. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna look into that today. Just these these storms of faith, these testings of our faith. What do we do with that? How do we handle that? Let's pray. Father God, we we recognise that we are to be a people of faith. You call us to be 
standing as people of faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please you, God. But Lord, we also recognise that our faith is not always solid, it's not always firm. Sometimes it seems to be more on shifting sand than on hard rock. And Lord, we, we acknowledge that in our humanity, that we're not always as sure as we know we should be. So Lord, I pray today as we open up these, these thoughts about what it is to keep our faith in the midst of storms, that you would speak to our hearts. And perhaps above all, just bring us that knowledge, that trust, that assurance that no matter what we go through, you are there. You are there for us. You are there with us. You are there in us. We thank you for this reality, Lord. We pray your blessing on your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Today's scripture is uh, Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41. And uh, we're going to have a look up on the overhead. We're going to have a dramatisation of that as it's read to us. Thank you, guys. When evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet! Be still! died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Amen. Oh. What an amazing, uh, an amazing account, an amazing event that was on the Sea of Galilee, on the Lake of Gennesaret. I've um, got a slide up here of um, Rembrandt's painting The Storm on the Sea of Galilee, which we all know was painted in 1633. Of course. Rembrandt's only seascape, so a significant painting, if for no other reason. Uh, you can see the guy dressed in green at the front of the boat, holding on to one of the mainstays at the front of the boat. Well, if you count up the disciples, there's actually 13 in the boat, not 12. Rembrandt inserted himself in the picture, looking out, looking out at us, the audience. Yeah, you can have a look at yourself later, you'll see that sound. That's Rembrandt himself. Can't actually go and see that painting at the moment, because in 1990 it was stolen, never been found greatest theft of personal property in the history of the world, as that was taken along with about 10 other paintings. And uh, no one knows who it is. So if you go to someone's place and you see it in my lounge room, it's probably a reward. So, uh. so what's happening here in this, in this event, in this storm? Well, Jesus and his disciples set out for the, the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, the lake, the lake or the sea is about 21 kilometres long, it's about 13 k's across. So it's a, it's a reasonable journey, even at some of the narrower points to get across there. And surrounding the lake or the sea is all of these um, valleys. And the wind blows through those valleys quite powerfully at times. And it's nothing for a storm to be whipped up on that shallow, on that shallow body of water to a height of 8 metres, which is a uh, pretty significant uh, ways, isn't it? And in this event, the storm erupts. And in that boat there, there's four professional fishermen, at least four that we know of, um, James and John and Andrew and Simon Peter. And I did a little bit of arithmetic, thinking these guys have been fishermen since our boys. 
now they're maybe mid-twenties, something like that. They've probably been fishing somewhere in the realm of 5,000 to 6,000 times. They always took Saturday off, of course. It's been good Jewish boys. They did. They wouldn't have gone fishing on the Sabbath. But on the other six days, they would have gone out. There was no long service leave, there was no holidays. They would have gone fishing. They'd probably been out that, that sea fishing, maybe, let's say, conservatively about 5,000 times. Do you think they'd ever seen a storm before? I think so. I think they've seen lots and lots of storms. There's plenty of times they've been out there and they've been in the waves. But in this, in this event, it's a huge one. And they're terrified. They're fearful. Where is Jesus? Well, he's asleep in the boat. And we'll talk more about that later. Mark doesn't call the lake a lake. He calls it the sea. He uses the Greek word thalassa. He could have used the word mini, which is lake. But he uses the word sea. And I believe there's that he did that on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to use that term. Because in using the word sea, his hearers would have made an immediate connection with other Bible events, particularly the moving of God. They would have uh, recognised, as they did in that, uh, in that culture, that a, a sea, particularly an angry sea, represents chaos and trouble and tumult. And they would have thought, the sea, hey, what does that remind us of? That reminds us that God took our ancestors out of slavery from Egypt through the sea. God caused the sea, had control over the sea, caused it to stand up and they went through. They would have been familiar with passages from the Old Testament, hundreds of years old, but they would have all been familiar with it. Psalm 65, 7, God our Saviour, who stilled the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves. Psalm 107, verse 28 to 30, says, Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. They would have heard this story of Mark and thought, Hey, Psalm 107. They wouldn't have actually, because they didn't know them back then. But... They would recall that verse, oh, this is familiar. Because they all knew, even as we know today, there's only one person, there's only one entity, there's only one being that controls the sea, right? And that is God. No one else can do it. I said in the first service, that, that, that multi-millionaire guy, Musk, Elon, Elon, isn't it Elon? Musk, put all the money in the world. But we know he's not going to come up tomorrow and announce to his shareholders, hey, I've got control over the seas. I've developed this technology to control it. We know it's not going to happen. Because the only person who controls the seas is God. That would have come to their mind straight away. And where is Jesus in this situation that's got out of control? Jesus is asleep. He's asleep. And that Cause me to reflect on Psalm 4 8, it says, In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. And Mark's here is again, could have reflected on that as well. I thought, wow, who sleeps in the midst of the storm? Well, the one who's got perfect peace. It's even possible that uh, they draw a connection between Jonah, Jonah and uh, this experience with Jesus because both of them are about control over the seas. There's some major differences. Jonah was running away in disobedience to God, and Jesus was in the perfect will of God. In Jonah's situation, he was powerless over the storm. He was subject to it. Eventually, God would control the storm and show his dominion over it. But now Jesus, hundreds of years later, Jesus shows that same dominion. And they would be all saying to themselves, who does this but God? We're so used to the story, you know, we've heard it a lot of times. But when you think of it, if you needed any affirmation, that because people sometimes say, oh, Jesus never claimed to be God. And have different people write things up. Oh, Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, he did, actually. He did in several places. But you've got this story of someone going, 
over a raging sea, be still. And the cow's dead. Straight away we say, that's what we got. No one else has done it since. Nobody can do it. You can't, you can't by experiment show that uh, to happen again. No one can do it. That, if Jesus never said, if Jesus never said, I'm God, it'd be hard to miss that clue. It'd be really hard to miss that clue. He's clearly God over all things, clearly the ocean. So, Jesus says to the disciples in uh, 440 when he, when he uh, comes out of his sleep, why are you so afraid? Have you no faith? Now you might think, well that's a bit rough, Jesus. It's a pretty scary experience. These waves are crashing around and we're diving around and it looks like we're done for. And Jesus seems to be a bit tough on them. I wonder why that was. I think part of the answer is because what have they already seen through Jesus? What have they already seen? What have they already experienced? They've seen Jesus' control over demons, over demonic. They've seen Jesus' control over sickness, healing people, miraculously, raising people from the dead. They've seen all those things. They heard his teaching. They heard his wisdom. And they still lack faith. And I don't know, I don't know what the First, I don't want to draw anyone else into this conclusion, but I think to myself, I think, well, I, am I so different? I can mentally assent that Jesus has power, that God has power. I can have read his teachings, see what he says about himself and about all things, and yet still fall victim to fear. I can have even seen God move in my past and forget about that in the time of trial, in the midst of the storm. I can be found asking the same question. Where are you, God, in my distress? Don't you care? I'm speaking about that. And maybe you sometimes feel similar. Because even as followers of Jesus, our fear of going under can be greater than our confidence in Jesus. Our fear of going under is greater than our confidence in Jesus, in his presence, in his love, in his care for us. Amen? Now, we live sometimes in a, in a pretty dark world. And if we just focus on the darkness, we just focus on the storms around us, if we're not careful, that's all we begin to see. That's all we begin to see. There's a terrible uh, murder in Melbourne last week. Israeli girl came to live in Australia. Ironically, chose Australia over New York because of Australia's safety. And she was murdered. And her father's come out last week and there was a um, silent vigil, huge vigil in Melbourne, about um, who's calling for just the end of this kind of thing. And her father was expansive enough in his thinking to say, um, no, Melbourne and Australia, it's not all darkness. I see the light and what's happening here in this gathering for my daughter. He could have just said, yeah, what a horrible place Australia is, what a dangerous place, what a terrible place. It is. But he didn't, he, he didn't focus solely on the darkness. He saw, yes, there, there's light there. And we, we, can, we can do the same thing. We can, we can refuse to just look at fear and chaos, seeing ourselves alone and cut off from God. Or we can open ourselves up to the promise of Jesus who said that the, not only that we have a great future ahead of us, but the kingdom of God is here now. That right now, the kingdom of God is among us. And it's not all darkness. And I, and I just take great confidence in the fact, and someone's got to remind myself of it as you do, that there's coming a day when the darkness of this world gets pushed back fully and completely and forever in the glorious light of the new day that's coming. I can't say how we But that's the reality. That's God's promised reality. That one day all of this dark stuff gets forever 
Not just pushed away. Destroyed. And the light of God's glory just shines over everything. That's good news. But what about the storms we, we face? Because life, let's be honest, life is sometimes a real storm for us. There's no denying that. Pain, fear, loss, bereavement, these things are sometimes part of our experience. And we are not immune to life because we are followers of Jesus. Sadly, that sort of doctrine has been preached from time to time around the world. I don't want to be critical or harsh on anybody. But nowhere in the Word of God does it promise us that because we come to Christ, all of our sailings on the sea are going to be crystal clear. That the wind is going to blow, the ocean's going to be flat, and you're going to get from there to there without any drums. The Bible doesn't promise us that at all anyway. To claim otherwise is to preach the gospel. It is not the word of God. So we're not immune to life because we're followers of Christ. Brick, Pastor Brick, and Kate, and Daisy Love, they were not immune to the storm, and neither are we. So where is Jesus when all this is happening? Well, he's right there with us in the storm. Does he care? He cares more than we could even imagine. We don't even understand how much he cares. I don't understand how much he cares. Particularly if you're new to faith today, you're exploring faith, you might be asking the question, well, Pastor John, why is there storms at all? If God is so good, if God is so loving, if God's got it all over, under control, why is there any storms? Why is there any just perfect? And where did you ask? Because there's an answer. The Word of God gives us the answer. God, you go right back to the beginning, and God did bless us with a perfect world. Adam and Eve lived in perfection. You know? Their street address, as we all know, was number one. Perfect street, Paradise Road, Gloria. That's where they did. Nothing ever went wrong. It was all good. Everything's good. There's no sickness, no pain, no disease, no dying. It was all good. And then mankind disobeyed. And uh, before we get too dark on Adam and Eve, we've continued the trend pretty well right down through history. Some of us. Probably not you. Probably just me. But it's gone on, hasn't it? And sin entered, and its inevitable fruit followed. Pain, suffering, illness, violence, and finally death. And that is inescapably the lot of our present world. That's what we see around us. It's undeniable. But God did not and does not leave us there. When mankind fell, God enacted a divine rescue plan for all of us. He sends his son Jesus into the world who lives a sinful, sinless, sinless, perfect life. He, he, he does all those amazing, marvellous things. He dies on Calvary's cross. He pays the price for us, for our sin. He endures separation from the Father so in eternity you won't have to. You'll never have to experience the separation that Jesus experienced. John 3, 16 to 18 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't come to condemn you, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but is a hinge. But is a hinge. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Every person on the earth, every person sitting here, can, can be in the place of not condemned or condemned. And the hinge is not God, but us. Our decision, our choice. Will I 
receive Jesus Christ and be not condemned? Or will I refuse Jesus and take my chances? The Bible says where that chance ends. So God has done everything He needs to do for us in that eternal sense. We're going to receive Jesus in eternity. But right here and now, we do still experience storms. Storms. But we can, again, there's a choice. We can, we can shelter in faith or we can be swamped by fear. We can shelter in faith or be swamped by fear. You know, God can change circumstances, and he sometimes does. But even when bad stuff happens, even when we're in the midst of something that seems uh, just overwhelming to us, we need to remember God is still there. And if we, our hearts are open, God will continue to speak to us, He'll continue to minister to our hearts in that situation. And let's never forget, no matter what we're going through, no matter what we're ever going through, if we truly know Jesus as Saviour, then the final storm is already stilled. It's already stilled. The destructive storm of sin and sin's penalty is stilled. Completely and utterly and eternally stilled for you and for me. You say amen. amen. Hallelujah. That's good news. No matter what happens, that storm has been still to you. You don't need to worry about that. Still. Let's talk a bit about control. About control. Control is one of the most deceptive concepts there is. That woman is out of control. Maybe more ways than one. I don't know. I don't know her personally. She's certainly out of control in her car. In the West, especially, we, we go along life's course and we are very insulated. Here in Australia, we are very insulated. By our wealth, by our standard of living, by our social and civic order. As I said in the first service, you might strongly dislike the Liberal Party, you might strongly dislike the Labour Party, you might strongly dislike the Greens. But let me tell you, you live in one of the safest, most stable, most ordered governmental bodies in the world. You are blessed. You are insulated. You might say, oh, it's not as good as it could be. Well, let's take a trip to Zimbabwe and see how bad it can be. Let's go to Haiti and see how bad it can be. Let's go to some communist countries and see how different it can be. Some parts in Africa, other parts in Africa. We are blessed, we are insulated, and because of that we often feel that we're under control. We've got things sorted. But even in this environment, even where we've got so much going for us, the storm can still come upon us. A job loss, a serious illness, a bereavement, these things can still come. Maybe a betrayal by a loved one, a storm can still come. And in those situations, we thought we were in control. Hey, we're also living a good life. We thought we were in control, but all of a sudden we find out we're no longer in control. In fact, we're heading downhill in a car with no brakes. I went out to show of hands. Some of you know what that feels like. Yeah. Truth is, you can't lose what you never had. And control is an illusion. Even in Australia, so much of what we think we've got under control, we don't. We don't control. But one thing we can control is our response, our reaction. You can't control your life, ultimately, but you can control how you respond to things. When the storm hits, again, hinges fear or faith in Jesus. Thinking I'm alone in this thing or believing that Jesus is there with me. We can choose how we respond. No one else can do it for you. No one else can make you respond one way or the other. You can choose. You can be like the disciples in the boat. It seems to me they are pretty wholly focused on the storm. That's all they saw. Or we can have faith in Jesus. And the problem with the fear path, fear only does one thing for you. You know what it is? Makes you more afraid. 
That's all you can do. That's all fear can do for you. It can just make you more fun. There's no good outcome from having a heart of fear. Well, let's, uh, let's just look at a few quick lessons out of this, this passage here. Um, firstly, you, you can be close to Jesus. We've already touched on this. You can be close to Jesus and still encounter storms. You can be close to Jesus and still have storms in your life. Uh, going through a storm is not a reflection on your spirituality, your godliness, your devotion to Jesus. It's none of that. To go through a storm doesn't mean I haven't prayed enough, I haven't read my Bible enough, I haven't been to church enough, I haven't tithed enough. It's not a reflection. You can be as close to Jesus as anybody could be and still go through a storm. My example in the first um, um, uh, service, and I, never, and I remember his name, Pastor Carl, is Charles Spurgeon, who was one of the greatest Christian authors of the 19th century. Great preacher. His whole life he suffered dark clinical depression. His whole life. Never got over it. He was depressed his whole ministry life. But it didn't stop him being effective, one of the most effective 19th century preachers there was. He was close to Jesus, but he still suffered that storm. Somewhere he obviously chose to kind of not be overcome by that thing. First Peter 4, 12 to 16 says, Dear friends, do not be surprised that the fiery ordeal has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Peter says, Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. Secondly, and this can be difficult for some people to accept, Jesus permits these storms to test us. Don't say he causes it, says he permits those things. 1 Peter 1, 6, 7 says, In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so, so there's a reason, so leads to a reason, these have come so that the proven generous of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though it is fine by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honour when Christ is revealed. So God permits those storms, and out of it is a purpose. And ultimately, the purpose is the glory of God. Thirdly, storms can press us to cry out to Jesus. And it's not a bad thing, even out of desperation, to cry out to God. But the answer to our question God, don't you care? The answer is always yes, 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 he does. He does. He does care. It's uh, 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Now, Peter was the author of those verses that we've just quoted from in those points. And even though it's not stated in the text, um, many commentators have suggested because of Peter's nature, because of his outspokenness, he was likely the one who was speaking to Jesus saying, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Peter the talking guy. Now, decades later, he pens this epistle. Decades later, he writes these words. And I'm not surprised that he would then draw on the faith experience of that event on the Sea of Galilee, but also the many other things he would subsequently suffer in serving Jesus. His faith had gone through many, many, many testings. Remember what Peter was like. I said this morning, so I don't mean to be rude or offensive, but early on, Peter was like a word of faith man. He would declare how it was to be, and then God was supposed to take notice. Jesus said, I go to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer many things, I'm going to be handed over to wicked men, I'm going to suffer the cross. And Peter said, no, that's not to me. I've got a better idea. I'm going to declare that you're going to be victorious. I'm going to declare you're going to be free of that. You are not going to. You should not see that thing happen to you, Jesus. And what did Jesus do? Jesus said, I receive it, brother. Hallelujah. Not quite. Jesus said, in not a very... Not a very encouraging way. 
get behind me, Satan. So whatever Peter's motivation for blabbing off about how good things would be if he was God, he wasn't on the right track. And we recognise, most of us here, having lived a little bit of life, that we just can't declare over our life that everything's going to be smooth sailing, that we're always going to have all the money we need, we're always going to have all the health we need, that no one we know is ever going to suffer and die. That theology, for all its attractiveness, it's got one minor, it's got a couple of minor problems. A, it's not in the Word of God. And B, if you're a pragmatic person, doesn't work. And, and if you come into Jesus on the idea that if I become a Christian, everything's going to be great, I'm never going to hand storms, then you'll go out on that same Jesus, because that's not real Jesus. So I encourage you to recognise that the Christian faith is not about all the ducks being lined up and everything going well. It's about our sins being forgiven, our relationship with Jesus being real, and that his presence in our life is right. You can walk in that faith. Don't walk in that one. But you can walk in that faith. You can know the abiding presence of Jesus. And which leads to the next point, which says, Jesus will calm your storm or he will calm you. There's two storms raging that night. One was the meteorological storm going on all around them, washing over the boat, and the other one was in the hearts of the disciples. There was a big storm going on there, wasn't it? Their hearts were terrified. In this case, Jesus calmed the outward storm for the disciples. He calms the storm. But sometimes the external storm will continue. The illness will continue. The broken relationship will continue. The financial struggle will continue. But Jesus speaks not to the storm of our heart and says, Nat, peace be still. Let your heart be still. Cat, let your heart Peace. Heaven, peace be still. Your heart is still. Jesus does it, doesn't he? Amen? That's what Jesus wants to do. He wants to come into our trouble and speak to our heart. The storm is not always going to be still. Oh, well, I wish I could promise you it was. I wish I could go out and say, hey, let's come up the front today. Every storm. Because I promise you that storm's going to be still. I can't promise you that. I'll pray with you about any situation like that and believe with you that God's going to do something. But what I can promise you is that Jesus can come into your heart and bring his peace. The word of God says he will. And I trust in that. Philippians 4 7 calls it a peace of God which transcends all understanding. All right, what happened to the storm that came upon Pastor Britt and Kate and their family? What happened to that storm? Well, September the 16th of February 2013, three and a half years later, after numerous battles, surgeries, little victories, along the way, after every effort had been made medically and in prayer, Eight-and-a-half-year-old Daisy Love passed away painlessly in her home. And I was just reading Pastor Rick's blog again during the week, and this is what he reflected in that week. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Pastor Rick goes on and says, Daisy believed this, and so do we more than ever. You know what I call that? I call that a peace that passes understanding. Peace that just transcends all understanding. We can't put ourselves in this situation and say how we would feel, how we wouldn't feel. But he's 
speaks out of his experience, out of Kate's experience, and says he still believes God. These pastors understand, right? Finally, if Jesus is in your boat, or more correctly, if you're in Jesus' boat, then you'll make it through the storm. Isaiah 43, 2 to 7 is in the Message Bible. It says this Don't be afraid. I've redeemed you. I've called your name. You're mine. When you're in over your head, I'll be there with you. I'll be there with you. When you're in rough waters, you'll not go down. When you're between a rock and a hard place, it won't be a dead end. Because I am God, your personal Saviour, the God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. I paid a huge price for you. That's how much you mean to me. That's how much I love you. So don't be afraid. I'm with you. Great words. Just finish with the story about the Titanic. The Titanic, we all know about the Titanic. April 15, 1912. Sailing the Atlantic, heading for the States. The ship that was said, even God could not sink her. It's on the headlines there. Well, it struck an iceberg. And three hours later, the unsinkable ship was lying on the bottom of the Atlantic with a loss of 1,503 lives. The Titanic was built in Belfast, Northern Ireland. The ship sunk on a Monday, and that Sunday, a huge congregation met at Derry Presbyterian Church there in Ireland. And every heart was focused on the 16 men from that area who had been engineers on the ship. For well, every one of them perished when the ship went down. And Pastor Andrew Smith preached to that church out of the same text that we're preaching from today. And in his message, he made these comments. He said, There was only one vessel in all of history that was truly unsinkable the little boat occupied by the sleeping Saviour. Then he added, And the only hearts that can weather the storms of life are hearts with Jesus inside. Is the true word ever been spoken? Remember the last thing the disciples asked? Who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Remains, remains the important question for every one of us. Who is this man? The answer we come get from the Bible is this. He's the Lord of creation. He is the incarnate Son of God. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He's the resurrected one, having triumphed over death. He's the Lord of glory. He's our soon coming King who will reign forever and ever. Amen. The disciples, at one point, feared Jesus' presence, but they soon came to love him. They loved him as their teacher, their friend, their brother, their saviour, and the shepherd of their souls. And today you and I can do the same. We can place our faith in that same Jesus. And for you today, if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Saviour, you can receive him today. You can receive him in salvation. We actually have up here, we have others a Bible for you. Information about becoming a Christian. We will pray for you. Pray with you. Let me tell you that no matter what your past has been, no matter what your present, present is today, no matter who you think you are, that you're too bad for God. Well, don't exalt yourself so high. You're not. I don't care how bad you think you are. If you bring yourself to Jesus Christ today, he will accept you wholly as you are. He will forgive your sins. He will cleanse you from everything you've ever done. And perhaps most importantly of all, He will write over your name. Son of God. Daughter of God. Beloved by me. That will be your condition today if you bow the name of Jesus Christ. It's up to you. But most of us here are Christians. Maybe we need a renewal of our faith. Maybe you've had 
a storm in your life that you're still recovering from, maybe you're still going through, and, you, and you've asked the question, maybe you still ask the question, God, do you care about me? And you really need to have that answer affirmed to you that yes, he does. Yes, he loves you. Yes, he cares for you. Maybe you get a renewed sense of that peace. Or maybe a reaffirmation that no matter what we go through this year, for all of us, no matter what we go through, we're going to promise ourselves that we're going to fix our eyes upon Jesus. That we're going to believe that his presence is real in us. That his love is real towards us. That he can never let us down. He's right there. Let's pray. Let's stand together and let's pray. Father God, we, we're here today and we acknowledge that Lord, life is not always what we want it to be. Lord, I thank you that you come and not only change situations, but perhaps even more importantly, you change the human heart. You breathe peace upon our lives. Lord, I pray for any here today who are struggling with the decision to follow Jesus Christ, to, to turn their hearts to you. I pray, Lord, right now you soften their hearts in the quietness of their own mind. They say, yes, Jesus, I want you as my Lord and Saviour. Forgive me for my sins. Receive me as your child, your son, your daughter. Lord, I pray, breathe that peace upon that heart right now. And for Lord, those of us who are going through things where we're really striving to see you there, I pray you bring that peace to our hearts that would assure us of your presence with us in that storm. And Lord, we don't know what this year will hold. We do not know what, if any, storms lie ahead for us personally or for our families. But Lord, we can say today to you, Lord, I'm going to look to you. I'm going to focus on you, Jesus, and not on the storm. If the storm comes, I'm going to lift my vision to you and not focus just on that storm. Lord, help us, we pray. Lord, we want to be men and women of faith. We want to be men and women of whose, whose faith has boots on. We step out in faith. We don't wish you was. We're not wavering. But Lord, we're saying no matter what is the end of us, our trust, O oh Lord, is in you. Because we know that you love us so little. We thank you for this in Jesus' name.